special event, and uh, let there be many more of them. So um, another thing I'd like to thank, um, thank the uh, organizers for is an opportunity that this gives me to do a little bit of wool gathering. Um, you know, it's often a necessary requirement of a talk that you talk about something cutting edge or something forward looking or whatever, but um, we're going backwards in time first. Then we're going to noodle around in the present and we're going to have a, you know, a sort of a, a wheels within wheels sort of uh, exploration of the cogs of the system. And then we're going to look to the future. And a, you know, a, a bit of an open uh, slate like uh, I was given by the organizers is a, a fantastic opportunity to do something that you know, doesn't happen every day. So it's going to be a bit of a galaxy spanning tour and um, uh, I hope you enjoy it. <coughs> And my timer just keeps going off, so, okay. Um, so, okay, here we go. So this is very much a personal perspective, and uh, um, you, know, you may well disagree with some of the things that I conclude at the end of the talk, um, but that's what tonight's dinner's for, and uh, I'd be really uh, interested in getting people's perspectives about my perspective, so uh, feel free, um, that's why we're here. So um, a little bit of background first. Um, the first time I saw the Great Barrier Reef was in New Guinea. This is it here uh, on this uh, raised terrace. It's 20 meters out of the water. It's just that it, gr it grew at the same time as the Great Barrier Reef, but up there, it's being pushed up into the sky. And these are all fossil reefs up here. <coughs> and I'm just going to use this as a little bit of a background window to who I am. Uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, I started out as a paleontologist and I was interested in studying fossil reefs and um, looking at <clears throat> ecosystems over time because here's a place where you can see them getting older as they go up the hill. And um, I got sidetracked into coral taxonomy and I moonlighted as a biologist for a while. But what I've really been doing mostly, and I've no audio anymore, hang on, let's get some audio here. Any excuse for some surf guitar? Um, <coughs> I've been basically noodling around in science communication for the last 25 years. And that's where my, uh, it presses my buttons because I can understand the science and I, I pas I'm passionate about trying to bring that into a space where we can all share these stories, many of which you know, are common sense. So how does, the, how does this, store, this sort of thing relate to the Great Barrier Reef? Well, I've lived in northern Australia since 1986, and most of my science communication activity has been focused on scientific output about the Great Barrier Reef. And so this is the Great Barrier Reef story according to Russell. So again, feel free to uh, sort me out later on tonight. So my first sort of message about the Great Barrier Reef is that it's really, 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 really big. And it's not just big physically. It's you have to sort of go and understand what big means in big ecosystem terms. And <clears throat> big, I think, means that there are many different kinds of country. So if you sort of come up to this part of the far northern section, you have what I call fear country. This is um, where the currents take your sailboat as fast sideways as it proceeds forward. And the waters are turbid and it's scary and you know, currents up to 10, 11 knots on the outer barriers out here. This is the sort of uh, stuff that humans avoided for a long, long time, and we might overcome it with uh, you know, satellites these days. But then we have Grain, Rain Island, the largest green turtle rookery in the world, um, swamp geckos par excellence on Cape York, the largest populations of dugongs are found in northern Australia, the last just remaining ones. Uh, then you look at these sorts of funny plants here. There are hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of deep water seagrasses and algaes that exist on the continental shelf between the reefs. These are remarkable. The marlins spawn on the ribbon reefs every summer here. They migrate here and they spawn on these reefs. 
Further south, we start to see things like minke whales coming into the system in the winter. The humpbacks are calving here in the midwinter, and so much so now in their thousands that they, you know, they're a navigational hazard to shipping these days. Um, as you move further south, <coughs> we start to pick up things like the, the Swains reefs down here in the southern section, which are, have some very famous high populations of sea snakes. The Capricorn bunker group in the southern GBR has caves, which are populated with Pisonia trees, which form colonies for, uh, you know, for colonies of nesting birds. Really distinctive things in different parts of the country. And if you want to find loggerheads, that's where you go. Loggerhead turtles, their you know, <coughs> nesting rookeries are in this part of the world. So the Great Barrier Reef is a series of big physical and biological brush strokes that make it up, and it's more than just the coral. So it's really, really big, and it's really, really diverse. Now, where did it come from? Well, that's a story that's going to take a bit of time to tell, because we have, need a little bit of background first. So to tell the story of the Great Barrier Reef, which I, I'd like to paint a picture for you, as a, the Barrier Reef is a, a biological phantom that comes and goes with the ice ages. So what does that mean? Well, you look at this. This is um, oxygen isotope records from uh, the, the last 500,000, but you could see these, this sort of pattern of um, ups and downs with uh, these kind of every 100,000 years or so, you know, a big up followed by a big down. This pattern goes back a couple of million years. This is what we refer to, all of us, we, we hear the, you know, the, the term ice ages, and the ice ages um, define the geological uh, epoch called the Pleistocene, and um, they're really regular. And they're driven by wobbles in the Earth's orbit, these tiny processional wobbles which, um, change the amount of sunlight or solar energy coming in, and that energy flows around the system and um, is interpreted, as we see through oxygen isotope causes, where the sea level drops 120, 130 metres, and we're in a, uh, all the water is in the poles, and then it come, uh, when we come to an, from a glacial or an ice age into an interglacial phase, the sea level rises by 100 metres, and we're sitting in a nice warm one right now. And we've been sitting there for 6,000 years. So there are these warm interglacial periods, and then there are these bitterly cold, if in ecological terms, for humans at least, um, glacial periods. And then there's this stuff in the middle. And uh, it's got a different name, but we'll talk about that soon. Um, oh, sorry, one last point is... Uh, just note that up here that some of these interglacials have been higher than present. So that's, that's an important thing to, to just bear in mind. It's not impossible for the sea level to be higher than it is. And in fact, only 120,000 years ago, the sea level was five metres higher than it is presently. <coughs> so how and when did the Great Barrier Reef grow? Well, if you drill a, a, a core through any of these reefs, you're going to universally find one thing, that the young stuff is on the top and the older stuff is below, and where the young stuff meets the older stuff, there's going to be a, a soil, a fossil soil. And so um, what we do know from drilling everywhere, from the Torres Straits all the way to the bottom, is that you get a layer cake and... Um, there was a, great, a phase, 120,000 years, when the reef grew, and then there's a modern, young, Holocene age reef, which is only nine to 6,000 years old. So let's have a look at that. Um, there's the last in the glacial, and that Ka is killer annum, starts for 120,000 years, and the the, the modern reef growth starts around about 9,000 years. I'm going to use round numbers because the sort of science is complicated in the sense that it's not a finickety detail. We don't want to go into finickety detail here. We want nice round numbers. So we're going to go 9 to 6 for the, the young stuff <clears throat> and then 120,000 for the bottom of the layer cake. 
And this fossil soil is this going to be this horizon. It's never like a flat horizon. It's if you imagine you went out to some um, you know, limestone province on the land and you see that wonderful cast topography where it's all kind of you know up and down. Well, that's, um, and that's what you imagine the Ice Age version of this looked like. It was a weathered limestone hills and it was probably all jagged and sharp and then uh, the sea level came in, overran it and the new reef grew on top. So the new reef used the old reef as a starting point. And the reef grew to about 6,000 years ago and then effectively it's been in a holding pattern. So clearly the reef's still there, it's still adding corals, but the actual accreting phase, the building, the construction, ceased or slowed down after 6,000, between 6 and 4,000. And really what's been happening is new stuff gets added at the edges because this stuff here has reached its ecological limit and the new stuff gets added at the edges. And another thing that's happened is um, if you imagine melting 100 meters of polar ice cap, you know, or adding 100 meters of water here and we're melting the ice caps and literally you're literally throwing millions of square kilo, uh, cubic kilometers of water onto the continental shelves of the world. And you're doing it in just a few thousand years. Look at that. So it's just a few short thousand years. You're melting all that ice, throwing it onto the continental shelves, and I want you to imagine jumping onto a bed. And you jump onto the bed and it springs down, and then it springs back up. And that's what's happened on the Great Barrier Reef and in different parts of the world. The continental shelves, all this water went flopped onto the shelf and it sank down and then it, a few thousand years later it eased back up. And that's called isostatic readjustment and it happens everywhere and the amount of readjustment um, differs depending on the width of the shelf and where you are in the world and it's complicated, finickety detail sort of story but we're not going to go there. All I'm saying is that when the, the reef reached sea, th sea level it seems like the sea level dropped ever since, but it hasn't. What's actually happened is the land has slowly risen because of the readjustment. And so all around the islands from here south, what you'll find is the reef flats on the islands have very, very old corals near the middle, uh, sorry, near the shore, um, micro atolls, like sort of parietes micro atolls, and if you date them out to the living micro atolls at the edge of the living reef, they go 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000 to the modern. So that's because the land eased up after having all this water thrown on it coming out of the Ice Age. So, grew in the last interglacial. If it was about plus five meters, we should be able to see it, right? Where is it? Well, you can't see it easily. It's in all the drill, drill cores. We never not find it in the drill cores, but there's this one place called Digby Island where the, you know, you, the stuff that you pick up on the, on the reef flat is, when you date it, is, a, is old, really old. For some reason, probably climatic, probably the uh, moist trade winds, these reef, the, the last interglacial reef has weathered away and it's only found in the cores. But there is a place you can see it. And you have to go over to Western Australia, <clears throat> where the same reef, that reef that I told you about, the last interglacial plus five meter reef, is preserved because of the desert, of the dry climatic conditions. And so here it is on the Ningaloo coast, and it stretches for hundreds of kilometers. The living reef is here in the water, obviously, and that bench, this plus five meter bench is along that coast for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. Now, this reef is incredibly important for scientific reasons, but I'm just going to say we're going to come back to this. Why would a boring piece of rock sitting on the coast be of interest to us other than, yeah, it's a, it's a raised reef, it's a fossil reef. But it actually turns out that this particular location is the key to a particular problem for us in our story. So, the Inglou Coast, raised fossil reefs, and I think you can even find bits of it down almost as far as Perth. So there it is, that bench, 
And when you, you look inside it, it's uh, full of all the, the good stuff you want to see. So it's a ridgy didge reef. Um, anyone want to identify that coral for me? Galaxia. Galaxia, tick. Uh, my bottle of wine goes to, who was that? Put your hand up. Yep. Oh, no, you can't have my bottle of wine. Oh. Dude, 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 that's just not fair. <laughs> that's not a fair fight. Okay. Um, right, so the GBR, we know that the GBR grows when the seas rise into interglacial times, but does it grow at other times? Like when, it, when we have these other things called the interstadials, they're just you know, other rises in sea level. Um, do we get reefs growing in these rises in the way that there was a reef grew in this rise and a reef grew in that rise? And the answer is yes. So in work in the, over the last sort of 10, 15 years, people doing um, multi-beam sonar work on the continental shelf have found all of these drowned reefs. And so this is around Hydrographer's Passage. It's worked by a guy called Robbie Beeman and, and others. And um, again, um, the, uh, there are people in this audience who uh, have all contributed to this story I'm telling you today. And Robbie Beeman, I'm not sure if he's here, but he's a, a, another resident of Cairns. Um, but basically, down to about 130 metres, that area there, that's uh, going to be one of these old reefs. And now, the thing about these reefs is they don't grow everywhere all the time, so it's hard to put this story together sometimes. But what you, you sort of, just like today, you don't have a continuous reef on every bit of the coastline. Um, and so what you have to do is you put together, you know, we've got a good sam sample there of that bench and a good sample here, but, you know, further along the coast, you'll pick up more. So we're not going to sort of convince you that every one of these bumps is here, but they are well known now, and they correlate with the oxygen isotope record of its time. So we know where these things are. We know how deep they are, but not how old. So how do we work that out? So we need somewhere where it's easy to study these reefs. So we're here. We've been over here. We found something useful I'm going to talk about later. And now we're going to go to the Huon Peninsula. Now, what is the Huon Peninsula? It's a, that bit of coast just there. But uh, what it is, in reality, and the you know, Papua New Guineans may not like this, but it's the crumbling edge of Australia. This is the Australian continent. And it isn't, you know, the political identity that is Papua New Guinea and the political identity that is Australia, they are owned by the Australian continent. And the Owen Stanley Ranges here are the crumbling edge of the Australian continent colliding with, Eura with Asia and the Bismarck Plate here. And this crumpling <clears throat> is causing the land to rise out of the sea. And it just so happens on the Huon Peninsula that there is snow everywhere. That's not snow, that's Google Earth's cloud, I think. Um, but let's call it snow. There's the alpine ski fields of Papua New Guinea. And, uh, and here is this incredible place. It's incredible because not only is the land rising out of the sea and dragging all these bath rings with it, these are coral reef bath rings, not only is it sort of bringing them out, but there's a rain shadow. There's a, this one particular stretch of coast about 100k long that's in a rain shadow, and the locals burn it every year. And so it's an anthropogenic grassland, and you get this perfect preservation of the, all these raised reefs. And what's cool about this is, if you look at this and use the eye of faith, you can see that the separation between the reefs here doesn't seem to be quite the same as there and down there. So what you actually have is the uplift rate is varying along this coast. And it goes from sort of like almost four meters per thousand years down this end. This is a gigantic fault coming through here. All right, let's go back. This is a big fault here. It's almost four meters per thousand years here, and it's about half a meter per thousand years there. So what you end up with is this extraordinary exposure of reefs. And here's the Great Barrier Reef time equivalent at a place where the, the uplift rate is two meters per thousand years. And it's 12 meters out of the water. And when you date this, the top of this, it's, hey, it's that magic number, 6,000 years, the same as when the Great Barrier Reef hit the surface here because the sea stopped rising. And um, there is a reef that 
grew at 30,000 years, that's been uplifted to this level. Um, so, and if you look at it closely, you'll see the modern spur and grooves here, and there's some older ones. And that one there is the, like 1,000 years ago, there was, in radiocarbon terms, um, there was a big earthquake and up she went, and, and then they grew again. And there's 1,000 years earlier, and this is the work I did up there, where I dated these things, and basically every 1,000 years-ish, there's a humongous earthquake, and um, up it goes, and you can even see you know, some of the spur and grooves in that, in that structure there. So this stuff happens over at geological scales, and the reefs just deal with it, they can cope. Along the coast a bit, the uplift rate here is at least, you know, nearly four metres per thousand years. That cliff is over 20 metres high. And this is the Great Barrier Reef, time equivalent reef, and they're patch reefs, they're gigantic patch reefs. So I went and had lunch, I sat on one and had lunch once. Um, and these are raised reefs just going up into the clouds, and this, the first day I was ever working this area, I was just, you know, um, introduced, to, I went with some archaeologists who were saying, oh, well, look, we'll introduce you to the locals and you can hang around with us for a week and practice your pigeon and, and you know, and then, we, then you're on your own. And the day I worked with them, we were in one of these creeks, or this one or this one, and we excavated a stone axe. And this stone axe was sitting on top of the 50,000-year reef and it was blanketed by two volcanic ashes, which we had... Well, they had dated, and they got they were like 46,000 and 42,000. And so this axe was over 40,000 years old, and it took the age of Papua New Guinea human occupation back from 9,000 years to 42,000 years. You know, and it was like heresy. Oh, this can't be right. But this is the sort of interesting place that this is. Every rock has a number because everything is datable. It's all limestone. You can either carbon date it or uranium date it. And so you can ask yourself, how old is that little valley? And you know by the things it cuts and touches how old it is. So roughly speaking, and again, I'm simplifying this story a little bit to have some nice round numbers here, but um, th these are crudely the numbers for the, um, the reefs on the Huon Peninsula. Now, um, if you know the age of the reef and you know the uplift rate, you can multiply that together and you can get the amount of number of meters that this reef has been uplifted and you subtract that, that elevation to know the level that the reef formed at. So you're halfway to knowing a sea level curve, right? So this sea level curve uh, here is derived from oxygen isotope data. And what happened is the geology work that was done by not by, just by me, but by many people in this area, what they did was they wanted to see if calculating the sea level by un-uplifting these reefs would match this curve, and it does. But it only works if you know the uplift rate. And how do you calculate the uplift rate? Well, that's why we needed that reef in Western Australia. It's they've got the last interglacial reef, we know this reef, we know in Western Australia, there it is, sitting there, it hasn't been uplifted, hasn't been moved, it's perfectly preserved, got a beautiful date on it, and what you take is that this reef, we know it actually grew at plus five meters, and then we go and find that reef over there, and we say, well, in the intervening 120,000 years, that reef is now however many meters high, and that gives you the little number to plug into the equation to then build your own calibrated sea level. And long story short, it matches. And there's still work to be done, but that is the way we're going to get the ages of these reefs. We can calibrate them and then look at their levels and correlate them. So that's just about the end of the geological story, but a, little, a few little postcards because we've got some, you know, it's a locals audience and we might as well get some local stories in. Um, the gold sand on the East Australian coast, all those beautiful gold sand beaches, it comes from the, the granites of the New England batholiths, the, the, the highlands in the central um, you know, coast, uh, the, the, the ranges of uh, central northern New South Wales. All that quartz weathers out of those things, 
down the rivers and out onto the continental shelf, particularly during low sea level times, the, the rivers take it all out there. And then when the sea levels come back in, which they do, they push that sand in along the coast and we've got these beautiful gold sand beaches all along New South Wales, Queensland coast, until Fraser Island. And when you get to that point, suddenly not much, it's not as much fun anymore. Um, the annoying Great Barrier Reef stops the surf. The surf doesn't get past the big reef. And then the gold sand sort of disappears. And, you know, it's you know, not as much fun as lying on the beach down here. Plus, there's killer jellyfish everywhere. <laughs> so where does that sand go? Well, what happens is it gets the, you know, the predominant southeast wave climate is driving it through longshore drift along this coast. And it gets up to here to break sea spit, and it spills into that canyon, and it goes down the canyon, and that's the end of the story. Goodbye, gold sand. But one note, you'll see these big islands, Fraser, Kalula is a big sand, pile of sand dunes, Morton, Stradbroke, all of those fantastic high dune islands. They're basically sand that's been swept in in these events, and it all gets piled on top of itself and so only these high phase sea levels are preserved, but basically the old dunes are on the west and the young dunes are on the east and they all pile in on top of each other. So there's a little bit of a geological background to um, where our sand comes from, where it goes, and uh, what this is when you go climbing all over it in your four-wheel drive. So what about back on the Great Barrier Reef? Paleo drainage. Well, what's that? You know, every river we have today was a river in the Ice Ages, and so here they are. You can see them uh, from Robbie Beeman's beautiful sonar imaging again um, and doing uh, seismic work, which is not as pretty to look at, but you can track these things back to their coastal equivalents. And um, I don't think anyone's going to give the science community the money to actually map all of these reefs, uh, all these rivers, but if we did map them, you can, with enough effort, you know, actually find where it went and back to the river of the day. So here's another one up near Prince of Charlotte Bay. You can just sort of see, and uh, you know, there were probably fantastic waterfalls in some of these pas passages that were, you know, pouring off a literally off a cliff, um, off dropping into uh, at Ice Age times um, into what is now the Coral Sea, but was then a um, you know a plunging shoreline with a beautiful limestone hill running along the whole rim. Now, for another one for the locals. We like, you know, it doesn't rain much in Australia, so it's, we've got to pump up our rivers, you know, and the Burdick is our big river because when it does rain, boy, there's a lot of stuff come out of this river and we're all very proud of it when it rains, but um, most of the time it's dry. Um, but you can see there is a, a, a very serious delta associated with the Burdekin River and there it is, it's Ice Age equivalent on the edge of the shelf. And this has been mapped fairly well. We do know where the Burdekin runs out across the shelf there. But, um, you know, these are uh, part of the geologic story of the Great Barrier Reef. It's a biological phantom. It comes and goes with the Ice Ages. And the system seems pretty robust, you know. It's tough. It moves around with a restless earth. So, you know, we don't have anything to worry about. The reef's going to be just fine. So how does the GBR work? <clears throat> how am I doing time-wise? 21 minutes left. I better get on with it. OK. How does it work? What a silly idea. How could I possibly explain to you how the Great Barrier Reef works? Anyone who kept an aquarium and knows the vagaries, I mean, it's hard enough identifying the animals, let alone trying to work out how their, their ecophysiology works. Um, it's a silly idea to say that you're going, I'm going to explain this to you. But I am going to try in a silly way. So um, I'm going to you know, tell you this story in two engines, some so a story about larval lifeboats cloning. I'm going to bring in some cement to pack it all together and talk about connectivity. So two engines of growth. Corals, why are they special? Well, you know, they are remarkable because they have two sources of energy. There's a plant that lives inside them that is photosynthesizing, recycling that met metabolic waste and turning it into sugar. And at night, there's all this plankton pillaging going on. 
So you get all this fantastic energy. It's, you know, it's just not very many organisms have two sources of energy. So a plant inside an animal. I, I still find that remarkable when I think of it. Now we're going to talk about larval lifeboats cloning and cement in this next video clip. So here's little coral larvae they have just settled. You notice that they're on pink stuff. And here's some more pink stuff and a beautiful little single polyp coralite. And then a little bit later, you can see that that guy's cloned. And there's the living beastie with its little polyp. So these little guys are secreting this calcium carbonate skeleton from that lower base, from that little, the, the veneer between the bottom of the tissue and the skeleton is this little magic world where all of this stuff happens. And again, you know, pause to think about that. That is extraordinary. So. Plants provide more than an indirect meal ticket for the creatures of the reef community. They are the reef community, incognito. After drifting for an empty eternity, arrival at a reef is the final stage in a great journey of survival for a coral larva. This is how marine creatures establish themselves throughout the oceans. But before they can fulfill their destiny, they must pass one last test. This is the Wall of Mouths, a carpet of predators that smother the face of the reef, straining, sieving and clutching the water for incoming particles. The Wall of Mouths has no conscience about whom it claims. But some larvae make it through and begin a remarkable transformation. After weeks, sometimes months as plankton, they begin to take on their adult form. This is the coral polyp at work. The lifeboat phase of its life cycle is over. Now comes the task of empire. Cloning is rare among land animals, but for those settled on the sea floor, it is the path to permanence. By making identical copies of itself, an individual polyp can grow to control the space around it as a colony. Over time, these printing press animals have come to dominate the reefscape. There are no empty rooms in these biological hotels, for the lodgings come with a job. Corals, more than any other creature, have used cloning to create the marvelous architecture of the reef. Tiny planktonic meals seem hardly enough to pay for all the construction we see here. Something in their ability to build the reef's stony fabric sets the corals apart from other reef creatures. And the secret to their success starts here. Eight and a half minutes from the sun at the speed of light is the planet Earth. And every day the Pacific Ocean basks. Bathed in the boundless free energy of sunlight, the reef is hard at work. The humble coral, a brainless tube with a ring of plankton stinging tentacles, is responsible for one of nature's great evolutionary achievements, the fusion of animal with plant. The coral polyp animal contains tiny plant cells dispersed through its tissue. Solar energy filters through and is captured by these plant cells. They thrive on a diet of sunlight, carbon dioxide, and animal wastes. In return, the plant cells release oxygen and leak sugars. They are like land plants living 
inside an animal. It's the perfect recycling system that combines both plant and animal engines, giving the coral energy to burn. Energy to build. So there's a little ditty that uh, Richard Fitzpatrick and I did, believe it or not, in 1998 uh, with 286 computers. Um, Richard's going to be speaking tonight. And, um, you know, uh, the resolution's increased, but the song remains the same. You know, it's, it's all very digital. So I, I just used three minutes of your life. Um, rather than listen to me talk, I thought I'd show you those pictures. Um, so we've covered the larval um, lifeboats. We've covered cloning. And uh, we've got to the point where we, we've got this energy to build and we know how it works. What about the cement side of the story? Well, we, we've got to have some respect for cement. This stuff, coralline algae, even in places where there are no corals, um, these structures you know, are there. You know, the, the, the big atolls in the eastern Pacific, there are places where it's primarily coralline algae. The, the corals build structures, and they, they do incredible things, but the stuff that holds it all together is the pink goo. And, uh, you know, respect. So... Okay, so we end up with these colonial castles in empty oceans. And that um, twin engine capability is, has got another fantastic thing. When you think about it, way out here in the Pacific, there is no land, there are no nutrients coming, there's very you know, rare isolated upwellings. So how do you make something from nothing? Well, you put plants inside your system and you get sugar for nothing and you recycle your metabolic waste and you get this plankton, which are you know, gathering stuff in an empty ocean in these oceanic deserts. The plankton gather it into little food bombs, and you grab the food bomb, and you st stuff it in your gob, and then during the day you photosynthesize. That's how you build colonial castles in empty oceans. It's an amazing achievement. So let's talk about connectivity. So there's more to the GBR than coral. It's a system of cycles, connections, and places. And this is running through some work that I've been, you know, I've been banging on about connectivity for decades now, but uh, um, how does that sort of represent itself? Well, a series of posters and educational sort of uh, adventures with uh, the scientific community and the Marine Park Authority and other agencies. This, this fish, the, the um, <coughs> pardon me, the mangrove jack, is a very popular food fish, a recreational fish, and much of its youth, its early life cycle, is spent on the coast and up in these freshwater streams, even up into the, the rapids. And so this species that people delight in catching in the mangroves, but also as an adult lives out on a coral reef, it needs the land. It needs fresh water to be successful. So just preserving the pretty bit with the corals is not enough. You need to keep the integrity of the system together because everything is connected. So here's another product about that. And um, it's, I've always been accused of, you know, you should have used the, the mangrove jack and this one and not the red because then it could have gone up there. And yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I end up, I went back and I did it. I fixed that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. So this is the life cycle of the, of the um, uh, red emperor. And you can see here, all of the habitats which we visualize by, and this is, this is again, this is quite old, you know, 98 again, um, it was a good year for me for some reason. Um, didn't get paid to do this, but, uh, but you, know, you can see little found objects here. These are you know, early pictures coming from sort of scientific um, uh, seabed trawls and you know, uh, surveys of what's actually between the reefs. And what we've done is we've visualized how these guys, they end up here, that's where you catch them, but they need these habitats in order for the, the system to work. Everything has a life cycle. And everything needs to be, that, that every place needs to exist for that life cycle to be successful. So everything needs a place to be throughout that life cycle. Now let's just have a look at one quick example because I don't want to run over time. I'm going to look at deep water seagrass and halometer mounds. Actually, I'm going to... Okay, yeah. So you can see how primitive this was. This is a World War II black and white aerial photograph. 
um, these interesting structures showed up in aerial photography decades ago, but no one really knew what there was was. And then that's a paper trace from a Furuno sounder from the, from the 70s, you know, and we were piecing together all these little bits of information, and I um, was fortunate enough to go and dive on one of these mounds in the 80s, and I um, didn't have a camera with me, but I got my artist friend Gavin Ryan to create this picture of it, and, you know, you, this halometer is a dominant algae on these mounds, and out there, there are also, you know, lots of this deep water seagrass. Everyone thinks seagrass is in the estuaries next to the mangroves, and that's all shallow, but out on the GBR, huge amounts of this stuff. And this is recent sort of sonar imaging. You can see that those sort of domal patterns, complex domal patterns, look at the scale of this, three kilometers. So between the barrier and the inner shelf, or the mid-shelf, because the, the coast is over here, um, there's all of this stuff going on. And basically, it's biological productivity is driven by water pushing up with nutrients being upwelled in a sort of venturi-like way through these reef passes, and then it circulates around, and the algae pick up this stuff. And because they're calcifying algae, they leave a skeleton, they leave these structures, and I can't for the life of me explain to you why they're domed or donut-shaped, uh, and why cyclones don't just sort it all out every few years. I, I just don't know why, but it's an interesting story. And there's hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of this stuff and it's important to the system. Okay, so there's more to the GBR than coral. It's a systems, it's, it's got cycles, it's got connections, and it's got places where things are that do stuff for you while you're at home watching TV. So everything needs a place to be at every stage in its life cycle. Now this is a, uh, something based on work that was done in an estuary just near Townsville, in fact right next door to the Institute of Marine Science, but Cape Bowling Green, and basically, this is what your average bloke who goes fishing in a tinny every weekend, he knows this stuff. They just know this stuff. They know when the, you know, the sardines are migrating out and when they form bait balls. They know when the herrings or the pilchards are doing this. They know when the mackerel and, the, and these guys come in. But in order for the, the society to know, to understand, you have to do a diagram and then you have to say it matters that you keep all these linkages. So the nutrients come out here, they, all these guys start out young, their larvae start out long, they, even the larvae of the predators start out in here and they cohabit on their way out to be adults where they spawn. And so the color coding gives you the timing and that, and you can show this to a fisher and the fisher goes, yeah, I know that. <laughs> but whether people will consciously Preserve it is another thing. And so, yes, I've drawn a diagram, um, and it's pretty. So, it's all connected. And I think this picture just shows you, look at all this stuff, all these gyres and things going on. It's all connected, and it's all happening while we sleep. So where's the GBR going? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to give you some moments to consider. So in 2010-11, we had the sort of 30-year flooding that happens in this part of the world. And it really rained. And you know, people talk about, oh, it rains in the tropics, but it doesn't really rain in the tropics every year. But boy, in 2010-11, did it rain. It really rained. And it's the monsoon. The monsoon came down in a La Nina year, and it hung around, and it really rained. And so much water came out of the river systems that the estuaries were overwhelmed and the seagrass died. It all just, there was not enough light, too much nutrient, too much sediment, and so on. And in those years, the dugongs and the turtles starved. Now, you go, oh, okay, well, that's only one year that, or two years that that happened. But you think, this is... You know, there was, there were, people were seriously thinking, and I'm looking at Randall, where's Randall? Yeah. People were seriously thinking about, you know, throwing crates of lettuces out of planes to, you know, how can we feed these starving animals? Because the Great Barrier Reef is supposed to be the last stronghold for these things, because in all sorts of other parts of the world, there is zero environmental regulation. And so everyone looks to the Great Barrier Reef as being, it's so big and it's so well managed, it can't possibly go wrong. But it did 
in 2010 and 11, and lots of these things died from starvation. So 2,000 kilometres isn't as big as you think. Now, in that same time, it just coincided with the advent of these new techniques. So we've got satellite imaging now. So let's look at this flood event. This is the wet tropics here. Wet tropics, for those of you who don't know, is the, you know, the coastal ranges and we used to be the, the rainforests used to come down to the coast here, but most of that's been cleared for sugarcane. But the, you know, the, the wet tropics is the high rainfall area um, in North Queensland. And you can see here that this plume over a period of days, so uh, February 11, or 9, 11, and 13, and you can see the plume actually makes it out into the Coral Sea. So initially, it's, it's dirty water and clay, but that doesn't, you know, and, and a lot of it is on the surface, right? It's low salinity. But beyond that are the nutrients, and the nutrients that are associated with sediments um, are carried out as well, and they cause biological productivity, and phytoplankton blooms. And so you can see the impact of that event way out beyond the reefs. So what everyone could see was huge plumes in the inner shelf, the coastal zone, but they can't see this because you need satellites to see it. But it's real and it's biologically productive. So what? Okay, so we've been in this catchment since the 1880s and they brought sheep up and the sheep all died. So 10 years later they brought up cattle and then most of them died because of ticks, paralysis ticks, but eventually they worked out it was particular breeds of cattle and now we have you know, tick resistant sort of stuff. Um, but basically what we do in our catchments, and I'm not pointing a finger at any particular community or stakeholder because you know, I go home and I have a shower and use detergents and uh, you know, I flush the toilet like everyone else and it's all contributing to this system. But basically, we are releasing nutrients, and those nutrients end up in the system. And we're, primarily, we're talking about nitrogen and phosphorus, but increasingly, we're also looking at the, you know, the various pesticides, which are, have long lives. So when you er cause erosion, when you break lands, you know, plant cover, um, you release sediment. But that sediment naturally wants has an affinity to bind nutrients to it. And it goes down the system, and the more it goes down the system, um, the more nutrients come in with it. And of course, nutrients are food. They're biological food. And so if you ever wonder why, you know, you often see algae choke streams, it's because there's just more nutrients there than the system can cope with. And if you add enough sunlight, and you, the way you add sunlight is by cutting down the trees, so there's no shade for the water, for the fresh water, um, it very quickly goes eutrophic. But what happens when this stuff gets out here, it also becomes food for other things. And the craniform starfish seems to be one of these things that does very, very well from increased productivity or in, in increased availability of nutrients. And so, again, I'm not here to you know, so much defend the science or talk about the science as to sort of say the current opinion is that the more we release sediments into the system, the more we throw unthinkingly fertilizers into paddocks uh, and so on and all the things that we do in urban communities that all contributes to an increased set of sediment and nutrient load and we get these crown of thorns infestations. Now, what I want you to do is just sort of say, this is predominantly the agricultural coast. Um, outbreaks are in black dots, and low coral cover is orange and red. So just look in the next clip, just look where primarily the black, orange, and red is, and we're starting from 1985 through to the present. So just focus on where the black, orange, and red is. 1992, you see these black dots moving down the coast over time. Two thousand and five, and there's basically waves. So we've had three or four of these 
four actually, of these waves of crown of thorns and stations. Here they are. They start up around Lizard Island and they move south. And those reefs are having a hard time because basically they're getting their... Right, how long have we got? Um, so they're, they're getting the, you know, they're getting this event repeatedly. So what we do on the land affects the reef. So the Great Barrier Reef is really big, but it's not as big as you think. So let's have a quick look at climate. Now, you've probably seen this diagram. This is um, uh, CO2 concentration, and this is temperature. As the CO2 increases, you see the global mean temperature is increasing with it. And we just haven't got the time to go through all this, but basically, you know, it's getting warmer the more CO2 is in the atmosphere. Um, we've got issues with coral bleaching. And this year was the third really, really big event. And the return time of these events is getting shorter. So you can see this is the trend for warming sea temperature. And the bleaching events, um, you know, we've always natural variability, but the return time of these events, they're getting shorter and shorter. So it was 1998 and 2004, and then they're back again. And so there's, there's a real issue because when you start adding these things up, you add up the crown of thorns, you add up the bleaching return times, you add up increased cyclonicity, it's getting messy. And the reef is resilient. It can run out of the road of ice ages and all that sort of stuff. But when it's stuck in one place, if you keep hitting it with a hammer, But basically, I, I show the weather data to go with it. And, you know, forgive the emotional music, but, um, you know, for me, um, I, I found this um, pretty uh, challenging because I can't think of a way out of this. Um, we can't move. This system can't move. We've got to deal with what we've got. So I want to tell you about my secret spot and what I think it all means. Um, North Direction Island, I used to do a lot of work here at Lizard Island. North Direction Island, you could get to in a dinghy in 30 minutes. It's an amazing place, or was an amazing place, um, because it had all these huge old colonies. Now, I like corals that most of the, you know, they're the too drab for the aquarium industry. They're not going to end up in most people's tanks. I like these sorts of corals because, as a geologist, I get a thrill from it. They're big, they're old, they've been around, they get intergrown contorted, they get weird, and this is the sort of stuff that I have to try, you know, the coral finder is designed to help you deal with this sort of variability in things. Um, 
And they're big reproducers. These are the guys who pump out, or the girls and the guys, who pump out the eggs that make the system you know, robust. Anyway, since I took that photo in 2010, because we actually got chased out of there by Cyclone Yazi or one of those, uh, might have been the one before Yazi. Um, um, there's the cots have gone through here. There have been a Category 4 and a Category 5 cyclone, and it's been bleached. So, you know, this system, these, in the 30 years that I've been diving in the reef, I haven't seen too many of these little pockets, little escaped, you know, haven't been hit by the hammer sort of thing. And um, they're getting harder and harder to find. And the one that I could have told you, yeah, you've got to go to that north side of north direction, that's amazing. You know, you'll see the, the, what the reef kind of really is like. Um, it's gone, right? So um, what does this all mean? I want to talk to you briefly about weeds and trees. Weeds are opportunists, they're short-lived, fast-growing, and they tend to be things that do well from fragmentation. You can smash them up in the storm and they grow back and then they reproduce sexually and then you smash them and they grow back. And so you, you guys know about this and they're brightly colored and everyone loves them. And trees are specialists, they're long-lived, slow-growing, and they're dominantly sexual reproducers. And in ecological theory, um, yeah, we talk about um, the, the disturbance frequency for Things that, uh, when you have lower frequency of disturbance, you get more complex communities. You get a mixture of specialists, sorry, specialists and 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 fast uh, opportunists. And basically, it's a more interesting dive. So when people say, "Oh yeah, the crown of thorns came through," and you go out to you know go out to Kelso Reef, it looks fantastic. Well, you're looking at a field of weeds. It ain't necessarily what the system is capable of or what it was like. So if someone tells you the reef's recovered and they show you a photo that looks like this with lots of pretty acroporas and stuff, you know, it makes my blood boil. So what does it all mean? Um, being big is no longer big enough. Our backup plan just got nuked. The pace of climate change, which is a whole other talk that I'd like to give you, but we haven't got that time. The pace of climate change is faster than what reefs have evolved to cope with. So yes, they can roll with the punches of a restless earth. They can get out of the road of ice ages and stuff, but they need time and space to do that. And we are cooking this system faster than they can cope with, and there is nowhere else for them to go. And the reef is becoming lost in politics. And if you follow the news, you know, it's just a nightmare. And again, you know, it's the sort of thing that makes scientists cringe because they can't get involved in political debate. But you, you will find that everyone has an opinion, everyone has an agenda. I'm not here to say who's right or what's wrong, who's wrong, but I am here to say that the reef is in danger of being a victim of this debate. Because the longer we wait and the longer we do not act in its interests, the worse it's getting. It ain't as good as it used to be. It isn't a total write-off, but it ain't what it was. There are no frontiers left to slip behind. So thank you so much, and uh, I'm, I'm over time, aren't I? So questions tonight? And